Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Hungary is a small country landlocked in the middle of Europe with less than 10 million people. Seemingly irrelevant, it is hated by the woke globalists. It's the focus of angry smear campaigns against it and its president, Viktor Orban. Yet at the same time, it's praised as a global leader for freedom and a model of conservative values. So there must be a lot going on with Hungary that we should understand. I, I, I see it as kind of a microcosm for the political and economic conflict in the, in the greater world. Um, so to dig in this, with this, I'm back with Shay Bradley Farrell, PhD, who is president of Counterpoint Institute for Policy and is an expert in foreign policy, national security, and international development, and who has also spent a great deal of time thinking about studying and, and, and traveling to Hungary. So, so Shay, why, why the hot <laughs> focus? Why, why, why is why is Hungary such a target of both the left and appreciated by the right? That's a, that's a great question. And that's what I, I start out uh, in the book that I wrote last morning to the West talking about why is this so important? Um, there's a lot of reasons, Bill, but they have been, they have a real model for how to fight back against the progressivism. I always say so-called progressivism because it's not really progressive. That is infiltrating the world right now, the Biden administration, the European Union. Um, and I really believe that they, they learned this because they were occupied by communists for 46 years. Um, and if you listen to Prime Minister Viktor Orban talk about it, the communism that we're experiencing today is very similar to the Marxism that they were under. And that's why they have no interest in it. Uh, they were occupied in and out by different peoples for about a thousand years, and they want to maintain their freedom and national sovereignty. So, you know, I, I think the uh, catapulting of Hungary to the stage has, has really been because they made the leftists very angry. Well, they have. We'll, get, we'll dig into that a, a lot more. You, you've written a book about this that was published when? Last month? Uh, December of 2023. And your title is uh, Last Warning to the West. Yes. Uh, Hungary's Triumph Over Communism and the Woke Agenda. Why the, why the title? <laughs> Good question also, because when I, I started doing research to write a book about Hungary, I was interested in finding out why their national identity was so important to them. Because if you look at the history of Hungary, Bill, you know, nobody else in the world speaks Hungarian. And as you said, they're this little 10 million people, landlocked country. But throughout their history, they have held on, no matter who was in their country in occupation, they have held on to their own sovereignty, their own culture, their own identity. And I had to find out why. So I meant for it to be more of an academic book, but then I went over and I started doing interviews of citizens out in the country, citizens in Budapest, some of the top senior officials in government. And one thing that Hungarians kept saying to me that startled me is that the rhetoric coming out of the United States reminds them of their Soviet era. So the more I started to dig into that and to look at the history of the Bolshevik revolution and the things coming out of it, like diminishment of parental rights, dividing children from their parents, uh, <clears throat> dividing people from religion, legalized abortion, uh, trumpeted as health care, these types of things. And we can go on and on about that and discuss that later. I began to see that they were right, that so much of the rhetoric and the way our government here in America, especially also in the European Union, is acting is in a, is in a very uh, top down, almost totalitarian way which perfectly describes their experiences with Marxism. Well, let's, let's do a bit of history. We don't have a map here on the set, but we'll, we'll dig one up and we can get a map of where, where Hungary sits mm -hmm. smack in the middle of Europe <clears throat> and it's landlocked. And right. at one point it was a much bigger country. And as I understand it, after World War I, uh, right. 
Woodrow Wilson in his, uh, in his wisdom was part of the process where they lopped off almost two-thirds of Hungary, so mm-hmm. it went from a rather big state to a much smaller one. But before that, they were, uh, what, what is their language? Ma- ma- could you help Magyar. Me out? Magyar. Yeah. Now, is that, their, is, is that a language, or is that, are they uh, um, somehow racially different, or is it, or are they just... Both. You know, it's so interesting because there's such a debate about where the Hungarians actually came from. <laughs> it's hotly debated. It's uh, you, If you dive into it, people will disagree with what you come up with. But the best uh, historian that I found was a British uh, man who, who actually had been ambassador to Hungary um, at a certain point of time, Cartledge, Sir Brian Cartledge. He wrote this book. I think it's the, it's been called the, uh, the, uh, the main history, I think, the, the most uh, standardized, the most uh, valued, mm-hmm. credible is the word I'm looking for. And he says that Hungarians came from the central part of the Ural Mountains. Uh, like third million, millennium BC, they broke off from a larger tribal federation and started moving west. And the Ural Mountains are sort of what <clears throat> separates Russia from, from um, the, the west, Western Europe. That's right, which is very important because if you trace down through Hungary's history, there's always been this uh, sort of balancing that Hungary has had to do between East and West throughout their history. Both they have to balance politically, they have to balance, you know, geographically with threats from both sides. Um, It's very interesting. But they, what I I found interesting also about their history is the more that they moved West and they were occupying certain territories and communities, most of the tribes doing that were absorbed by the places that they inhabited. But the Hungarians were not. They maintained their language and they wanted the people that they, uh, where they had settled, they wanted those people to adopt their language. (laughs) So we come, you know, thousands of years later and we still have Hungary, only Hungarians speaking Magyar. And, uh, as you can see, you know, wanting to preserve their culture and identity. So they've all learned English because they've got a function many, in the business yes, world, many. diplomatic world, scientific world. Do they have a second, a third language that they use, or is it uh, because they're what is it? They're now uh, Romania is now was the portion that was lopped off uh, during, after, during right after treaty, World War uh, yeah. One. What do they call that treaty? Trianon Treaty. The Treaty of Trianon, which was and... that, that was Versailles. And, well, yes, in 1920 was yeah. when the treaty was done. Um, it came after uh, the, or during the series of treaties of Versailles, where, yes, two-thirds, Woodrow Wilson and the Allies uh, decided to give two-thirds of Hungary away to the surrounding countries. And Romania was the one that gained the largest territory. And, Bill, over half of Hungary's population was lost to these other countries. So they were severely weakened by this, and it's part of their identity even well, I w- today. I want to make this point simply because there's all this talk about borders, hmm. obviously our own border, but uh, Ukraine. And Ukraine has been mm-hmm. same thing. Their borders changed every every 30 years or 50 years or 100 years or whatever the course of time, and there it's largely back and forth with Russia. But Central Europe also, many of the same things. What we think of as countries on a map today, if you, go, if you do a time, time lapse over the last thousand years, just massive change in what countries call themselves and where Very their true. borders are. Hard to keep up with, isn't it? Well, and, and we don't really need to, but it's, it's, <clears throat> the reason I want to do a bit of history is World War I, it got shrunk, and then that gets us into the 20s and 30s, and then the 30s, the Germans, started uh, looming in Europe, and that uh, in World War II, Hungary became, I guess, allied at first with German, Austria-Hungary, and then actually got occupied by Germany. How did that happen? Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, The Treaty of Trianon really weakened Hungary, so they were very vulnerable to Germany. But at the same time, they were saying to, to the Allies, you also need to be watching out for Russia. Nobody was, nobody really paid attention to Russia as any kind of a of, of threat, and um, Russia was then the Soviet Russia. Yes, 
That's right. And so, um, <clears throat> let's see, you had, uh, you asked me going more towards World War II, correct? Well, I guess Excuse the me. point, uh, the, what yeah. I'm digging into here is that you, your book is fascinating and the way you draw the, sim the Hungarians see this, the way you draw the similarities between the totalitarian nature of fascism yes, and, and the totalitarian nature of communism. Mm -hmm. And so that's, the, that's right. The so, Hungarians experience rule by the by the Germans, and as I understand it, in, in Budapest, which is the capital, mm -hmm. there was actually a big building that yes. the Germans had occupied, and that's where all the torture chambers and yeah. prisons were. That's right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. In uh, 1944, see, uh, Admiral Horthy was the regent of Hungary at that time. And he had been trying to keep the Germans back, sort of doing a tap dance between the Germans and the Soviets to keep them both out of Hungary. But in 1944, ultimately what happened uh, is Hitler rolled into Budapest in 1944 in March. He lured Horthy away to Austria. So uh, when Horthy returned, Germany had invaded and occupied, excuse me, <clears throat> and thus began, began a reign of terror. And this uh, building that you refer to... During World War II. During World From War II. 1944. 1944, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. And uh, this building you refer to was occupied then by the Aerocross Party of Hungary. What happened is the Aerocross Party was the National uh, Socialist Party. It was gaining in influence. So Hungary was not a fascist nation. And sorry, I'm losing my voice today. <laughs> Drink some water. We're good. <clears throat> a little water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, so this building was what was, was called the House of Terror? The House of Terror, yes. And actually, um, I believe it was the Soviets that named it that, but either the Aerocross Party, Nazis, or the Soviets. But because Hitler came in and occupied and uh, arrested all of Horthy's cabinet, um, took over their railroads, their infrastructure. The Aerocross Party, which was relatively small in Hungary, was able to take power. Hitler was ultimately at power, but the Aerocross Party uh, took over the House of Terror, made that their headquarters. There was a basement in the bottom where they tortured and killed political dissidents. And what you referred to is something that I found very interesting, is uh, the very next year, the Soviets rolled in, sieged Budapest, pushed the Nazis out, but the Soviet police uh, established their headquarters at the House of Terror and did the same thing. The very same building. The very same thing. Well, well, wasn't there a point there I thought was interesting where there was a, there were, the, the communists were rife in uh, Hungary and they felt so confident of their position that they told Moscow that we can go ahead and hold elections here in Hungary because we're sure the communists will, will yeah, win exactly. the election. Yes. And then they held, and this gets to the character of the Hungarians, mm -hmm. they held the election and the communists lost. They did. <laughs> and they were startled. <laughs> and then and then they then they just took it over yeah, by force. Yeah, they took it over. That's exactly right. Um, I thought that was an interesting point. And if you go back to Yalta, where Stalin and FDR and Churchill get together to also divide up Europe in, in World War, uh, after World War II, or before the end of World War II, you find that we gave Hungary and Central Europe over to the communists. Um, so anyway, your point is correct. Well, these, I, want to do, I want to get into these threads because they bear on what's happening today. And we're fighting Germany. We're allied, supposedly, with the Soviets. And there's a very famous scene at the end of the movie Patton where George Patton is saying, well, you know, we've, 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 we've defeated the Germans, but now we got to go after the Soviets because they're our real enemy. Uh -huh. And he is, that's sort of made light of during the movie. And of course, um, Patton died under sort of mysterious circumstances. And you kind of wonder well, who was behind that, but hmm. FDR was surrounded by people who were on the payroll yeah. of the Soviets. Yeah. in the U.S. government. That's right. And so we were That's infiltrated right. by then, by, even by, back then, by people who were not playing for our team. And so when it came down to mm -hmm. deciding what, what the, we should let the Soviets do at Yalta, Hitler 
or not Hitler, but uh, FDR said, oh, well, Uncle Joe, we can just give it, give him what he wants. Right. And that's because he was influenced <laughs> so much by these people who were part of the uh, Communist Party here in the United States. And, and Bill, you've got to go back to 1939. Um, there was a secret pact made between Hitler and Stalin right. before uh, Germany even invaded Poland to start the war. So Russia and Germany were aligned. Um, this pact divided up Europe, cent Central Europe particularly, uh, and Eastern Europe <clears throat> between Germany and the Soviet Union. The world did not know about this pact until the Nuremberg trial. So just maybe a month after that pact, secret pact was signed, uh, Hitler rolls into Poland, invades Poland, starts World War II. Two weeks later, the Soviet Union comes in behind them and rolls into Poland as well. So we, what is very interesting <laughs> is the way that they had decided to divide up Central Europe is exactly what Stalin got uh, at Yalta. So we don't, you know, and then at the Nuremberg trials, there were actually Russians sit sitting in judgment against the Germans during the trials. And, and you know, they were, the, the Germans, rightly so, yeah. committed war of aggression. Yeah. Well, what about the Soviets? They did also. You know, we, for we forgot that. And in forgetting that, we turned over exactly what Stalin wanted, Central Europe to Stalin. And you'll find out if you read my book, but, and you know history, that what Stalin did then, that gave him decades of Sovietization, Sovietizing these countries, these satellite countries. So we're to blame for a lot of the spread of communism. Uh, this is Bill Walton, Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Dr. Uh, Shea Bradley Farrell, and we're talking about her book, Last Warning to the West, which is about uh, Hungary and the reason we're going through this very interesting, <laughs> hope you find an interesting history lesson, is this all bears on where we are today. And I, at this point, I might substitute China for the Soviets, but I won't, I won't fast forward Absolutely. to that just then. Yeah. So let's stay, let's stay in, in the post-World War II period where FDR essentially handed Hungary yes. to the Soviets. Yes, he did. The Soviets came in, and what happened? They began their process of Sovietization, and the first thing is to establish a secret police force. They did that at the, the headquarters was the House of Terror. So they uh, tortured political dissidents. Um, they did a lot of other bad things, of course. They started sending people in mass to the Soviet gulags. Millions of people at the end of, you know, the, the Soviet occupation days had been killed in these Soviet gulags. Another thing they did is they took over the media so they were the propaganda arm of, of the country that they were in, especially, this especially happened in Hungary. And you know what, something interesting too, Bill, is another step of so Sovietization was to ban civil society. And I really dug into that aspect of it because it's, it kind of sickeningly, sickeningly destroys uh, a society when you do that, it, particularly in Hungary, uh, they banned 5,500 civic organizations. Civil societies like clubs, Boy Scouts, associations, uh, Rotary Club. They didn't have Rotary Club in, in, in Hungary, but things like that. Yes. And they took over the book. They started redefining uh, hung Hungarian history. They weren't allowed to celebrate their national uh, in Independence Day, the uh, Habsburg Revolution, uh, when they became independent and an independent nation from Austria, uh, they weren't they weren't able to celebrate these things. They were told to take their crosses down and their Christian symbols off the wall. They had to put the communist uh, dictators' faces up on their walls instead. So the thing with civil society is even people, academics like myself, weren't in some cases if they were controlled, they were allowed to continue to be academics. But many of them became, you know, very menial task workers. Uh, they were not allowed to write books. They were not allowed to speak. So you lose your livelihood. You lose your purpose for life. And uh, I, Sir Roger Scruton talks a lot about this. Do you, it's in the book. Yeah, I, we had a place in Rappanick County, Virginia, and he, he had a house there. Oh, wow. And so we met him. No yeah. kidding. 
interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I quote him a lot in the book because not only was he a great conservative mind, but he for 10 years was working in the underground of Czechoslovakia, Poland. He was there working in Hungary yes. as, a, as an underground uh, operative. Taking in uh, leaflets, pamphlets, like books where people could study. Because under the Soviet, they weren't allowed to study things. They couldn't study history. They couldn't study philosophy. Yeah. So he would go to these secret meetings and pass out things. He would also help communication along in the underground networks. And he was actually arrested. Um, and I believe it was in Czech at, at the time. Um, I forget the, the town, but he was arrested, later released. But yeah, he had he was eyewitness. To all of this. Well, you have his thoughts and other people's thoughts. There's like an eight step or 10 step piece to the Sovietization of these of, of Hungary and all the other countries uh, that they took over. Yeah, four steps. It, it was a it was a it was a playbook. Yeah, that's right. Um, I was gonna and say it's something similar, else eerily similar to a lot of what's going on now in the United States. I think which maybe is why this is relevant to what we're uh, what we're seeing today. It is, you know, so Scruton was an eyewitness to all of this. And what was very interesting is before he died, he did a lot of writing on how the EU is acting very much like the communists were acting. In fact, his quote is the main quote from my book that says, you know, just because uh, people are no longer behind this wall, this iron curtain, doesn't mean that they're not also being uh, oppressed by a body, and he was referring to the European Union. Perhaps you could probably... Yeah, he says, don't accept the EU propaganda vision or version that we are celebrating the fall of the Berlin Wall as though freedom is all here. I'm going to paraphrase a bit. Right. We're cel that we're celebrating national sovereignty to people who would have been absorbed and impressed by a lawless empire. empire. The fact is they are now being absorbed by a lawful empire Mm -hmm. doesn't alter the case that's that it right. could be equally totalitarian. That's exactly and in his case, right. he meant the European U Union. Yes. So lawless empire of Soviets, obviously, but the European Union. So he was when trying did he, to get... When did he write this? This was 19... I think that... Early on? That quote, do I not have a, a date underneath no, it? No, it doesn't matter. But, so, but he saw the EU now has become very oppressive. Yes. And the, and the member countries are beginning to push back. On, on a lot of this. They sure, and, and Hungary is the leader of that. And so that's, to answer your question, <clears> why <throat> Hungary? That's a large part of the reason. Uh, they, this little country, you know, Prime Minister Viktor Orban was one of the revolutionaries that pushed the Soviets out. And he became Prime Minister uh, about uh, nine years later for the first time at that time, then he lost again. And then, you know, later on, he, he's been reelected now four times in a row. We mentioned, I think when we were talking before the show, you mentioned uh, three big things that the EU is really offended yes. by. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you have to laugh. Um, it's the same three things the Biden administration is offended by. Yeah, well, by that's, and, that's, that's the parallel I want yes, to dig into. And why we have an antagonistic uh, ambassador over in Hungary, which is very embarrassing. But they are uh, this transgender nonsense. Uh, the EU wants to push radical gender theory into Hungary, into their schools. Uh, Hungary has actually made laws to say no. Parents get to decide what children are taught about sex or sexual identity, whatever you want to call it. They even took a referendum where the overwhelming majority of people said, we don't want this. Um, the second thing is illegal immigration. They are going through very much the same of what we have gone through um, except there was a point during the Arab uprising when they were allowing people to come through their country into EU, as as you know, Germany said, our borders are open. You know, they they said we have to stop. They declared a national emergency because they couldn't handle it, and they actually erected uh, fences. <laughs> and the the third issue, Bill, is the Ukraine war. They uh, they have Hungarians, ethnic Hungarians, you know, because of the division. Uh, which we talked about earlier. Well, and they share a border with Ukraine. They share a border. There are ethnic Hungarians fighting in this war. And uh, they simply said we were against sanctions because their economy relied on Soviet uh, gas and uh, energy. And uh, anyway, 
you know, I can go into depth. Well, no, we should we depth, should go into but... depth because it's it's important because it bears on what's happening in the United States right now. Yes, and with the immigration issue, they were ordered by the EU that they had to let I don't know how many hundreds of thousands, ten million people. I don't know that that's a lot. I don't know how many they ordered. They said you have to take in. Uh, X number of immigrants from Muslim countries. They do give, uh, the EU does give migrant quotas to Hungary and the is other it, Are numbers. they mainly Muslim or is it a, is it a polyglot? I mean, it, it is a variety, but it is mainly Muslim that have come through. And, and they uh, were ordered to take them and Victor Orban and, and now I think yes. they can keep in mind, or they, treat, they try to single Orban out. He's supported by like 70, 80 percent of the Hungarian voters. Oh, yes. He was, he had a landslide victory in this last one. You know, in his very first election, which was 98, I believe, he won two thirds of the majority. So he was able to actually uh, reject the previous communist constitution that they had and put in a democratic uh, constitution. So he really is, and they do referendums on all, sorry, on all three of these issues, they've done citizen referendums, and we're talking like between 78 and 93 percent of the people <laughs> say no to all three of these issues. So that's the point uh, he makes that I make in the book. I mean, national sovereignty is important. They're a member of the EU. They want to be a member of the EU, but they want to maintain their own decision-making power. Well, that's the bigger theme for all of us. I mean, American yeah. sovereignty... We, we, you know, our own border. Yes. Uh, what, what's happening is egregious. Yes, it is. And on purpose. But the EU, the people in Brussels are the same mindset as the people in the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they want to change the culture of Hungary as much as they want to change the culture of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And you look at what's happened in, uh, in France. I, I've, I'm, I'm involved with a group that writes, in, I think, very interesting things about the markets worldwide. They talk about France, and they're, they're Frenchmen. And they say, well, France is basically have three elements here. If you want to understand what's happening, there's the central element in Paris, which is the elites, mm -hmm. the intellectual class, business, government. And then surrounding Paris is a ring. And in Paris' case, it's a literal ring of immigrants. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're there to serve the elites with, uh, you know, gardening and what truck driving and whatever you do. And then outside that ring is the rest of France, which is, I think, 60, 70 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. And that 60, 70 percent outside those rings is beginning to push back. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason Macron has become so uh, with his approval rating now, 18%. It's not good. He's bordering it? on Joe Biden numbers. <laughs> he may be actually doing worse. worse. <laughs> is that possible? Worse than Joe Biden. Well, but, go ahead. But that's happening in every most of the countries in Europe and even in Germany. Yes. We're seeing German farmers beginning to push back. Yes. And that's what that's what Orban stands as a, as a symbol of uh, uh, in Hungary. Absolutely. I, I think he's quite a leader of it. Uh, Italy voted in a uh, conservative prime minister. We see uh, in the Netherlands, they just elected a conservative who will form a conservative government. Um, Bill, yeah, I have friends in Austria from the Freedom Party who they are leading in the polls. That's the conservative uh, party there. They're leading in the polls now. And you're talking about the farmers in Germany, the farmers in France. <clears throat> Javier Mille was elected in this country that's been socialist for over 100 Argentina. years. Argentina. Yes, in Argentina. My favorite. He, he Love what, you it. know what he they call what he calls himself? What's that? An anarcho capitalist. <laughs> An anarcho. anarcho capitalist. Yes. Isn't that a great word? I, I, I saw that. And also he has very cool hair, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. he's in a rock band. <laughs> well, he, it's a it's a Rolling Stones cover band. <clears throat> oh, is that right? <laughs> so I guess he does uh, Mick Jagger on top of everything else. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well he's an interesting guy, isn't he? Yeah. But your point is right. I see another populist uprising all over the world right now. Um, and, you know, I, I think that when Trump got into office, we had the first wave of that. But we're seeing that more and more. And <clears throat> just to go back to what you said about <clears throat> the influx of illegal immigration in Europe, what's very interesting is that the countries that said no to this illegal immigration, mass influx, Poland and Hungary, 
have had no terrorism. Now, the other countries have seen a massive rise in terrorism, especially since the Hamas attacks. So isn't that interesting? And also crimes like rape. Crimes like rape, yeah. Particularly in the Nordic countries. Hmm. That I didn't know. Yeah, it's bad. It's an epidemic. It's uh, Wow. It, it, they're, they're seeing their culture dismantled. Yes, that's right. So with we, we, the, the funding, the Ukraine, well, let's do the JLBGT agenda because that's the Hungary is about 70% ca Christian Catholic. Yes, yeah, it's about a Christian right? nation. They've been a Christian nation for 1,100 years. So. Roman Catholic. Not Eastern, not Roman, not, Ro not right. Russian, Western. Roman Catholic. They became the easternmost Western kingdom in uh, a, a thousand AD. And they're very serious about it. Very and they're serious. They're really Catholic. saying we want to live by our Christian virtues. That's and of right. course, they have issues with, uh, with the LGBT transgender issue. Yes. And they pose it and they pose it uh, vehem vehemently. And what does Biden do? He, who tell us, give us the profile of our <laughs> ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to, to Hungary. Have mercy. Our U.S. ambassador to Hungary in his confirmation hearing in the Senate called Hungary a backslider of democracy, an authoritarian government, aligned uh, Orban with Putin and with China. This is, this is how he started out. And you have to understand, uh, Hungary is a country with a, like I said, it's a republic with a parliamentary system. Uh, they have a, a democratic constitution. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Hungary, three months last year in Hungary. And for example, nobody cares if you are a gay couple. I, we saw, my husband and I saw gay people walking around holding hands. Nobody cares. But the majority of the people are saying, that's not what we want to decide for our children. And yeah, they are. They do not uphold an LGBT agenda. That's true. I, I just say that to say, you know, who, human rights are uh, upheld well, in Hungary. Isn't our ambassador also gay? Yes, which I don't think is uh, a an accident by the Biden administration. Not an he's, accident. he's married to a man. <laughs> not, not they an have accident. two children in Hungary. Again, they the Hungarians would respect him and respect that, except. He has gone out of his way the whole time that he is there to publicly uh, uh, rebuke and punish Hungary for their stance on these three issues that I've told you. With our money, by the way, they've rented billboards with our money to shame Hungary into uh, wanting to support uh, more money to the Ukraine war. And I can explain why they're, they don't want to do that. Um, I do explain it. <clears throat> Well, let me start out by saying I was in the Ukrainian Refugee <clears throat> Center last year in Hungary. Uh, they've spent, they won't say how much, but, you know, they've, they've taken in over three and a half million refugees from Ukraine, many of whom they paid plane, train, automobile to go wherever in, the, in Europe that they wanted to go. Um, but it was a very nice center set up. People were being taken care of to the ninth degree veterinary care services even which you know i'm a dog lover so i thought that was kind of cool yeah me too but um <clears throat> they first started out were against western sanctions uh on russian energy because they're reliant on russian energy they're a small country and they said it will crush our economy <clears throat> they're trying to diversify but can't do it that quickly <clears throat> the other thing bill is um, you know, and I, I've actually had the privilege to sit down with Prime Minister Viktor Orban with a group of other conservative leaders and talk to him about these things. He's a very thoughtful man. The other thing is, you know, over 400,000 Ukrainians have been killed, some of whom have, are Hungarians ethnically. Um, and they, they. That's not a widely reported number in the United no, it's, States. No, I've heard it's it's close, it could be closer to a million. You know what, at this point, because this number I'm, I'm using from uh, probably six months ago or so. But we, nobody really so. knows. Nobody but knows. But it's underreported. Well, and I will tell you, my husband and I, you know, living in Central <coughs> Europe last year, we were seeing a lot of the real reporting, not the U.S. BBC reporting 
that is propaganda to support the Ukraine war. We were seeing the horrific casualties that the Ukrainians were taking, the infrastructure that has been leveled. And Prime Minister Viktor Orban and I believe that Ukraine is not going to win this, that Russia is going to grind on and on well, you until and I they devastate think it. We should get into this even two years ago. We thought two we could negotiate ago, something that would be a settlement that would yeah. satisfy Putin and get him to stand down and this That's need right. not have happened. It was, it need not have happened. It need not have happened. That's exactly right. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, yeah we were it was there. almost remember, two remember, years we were, this, ago this we is... talked about that and we tried to get the U.S. to broker a peace deal. Yeah. We're still not talking about a peace deal in, in the administration. This is crazy. It's crazy. Well, now they're lobbying for what, another $60 billion as part of this so-called immigration bill. Yes. And if you look at that bill, it also implies that we're going to continue ongoing to fund. Uh, so they know the war will be ongoing. <laughs> yes. So the, $60 so, billion. So, so sticking in, in, in Hungary, it's such a great... What I'm hearing you say about the Hungarians is they're a generous people. They, they're not, they're not uh, excluding, for example, the gay population. They just don't want to change their, their institutions. They don't That's want right. to change their laws. They want to make parents' rights uh, uh, preeminent. Yes. And so, <clears throat> so long as that's the case, that they're tolerant of people. And they're also, in Ukraine, it's not like they don't, they don't want to help Ukraine. They're helping them to the tune of bringing in 3 million people. <laughs> yes. Yes. But they don't want to supply arms to Ukraine, and they right. don't think that that's the right strategy in dealing with this. They don't. Which is very sensible. <clears throat> but, Bill, you know, we are trying, and the EU is trying to strong arm them into supporting the war. The EU, just last week, there was this confidential document that the Financial Times found that showed that the EU was actually planning to destroy uh, Hungary's economy because. Uh, Orban at the time would not support this $50 billion loan that the EU wanted to take up to, for Ukraine to continue it. Um, they were talking about doing, the EU wanted to uh, discourage investment into Hungary, devalue the currency. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, um, they have really, they've sanctioned Hungary previously on COVID emergency funds, all funds that Hungary has actually paid into the EU already. So it's really, it's been quite a battle. Well, and, and uh, Orban's hanging strong now. Unfortunately, Orban and Trump like each other. Yeah, they're So that's friends. another another <laughs> rap against. <laughs> that's right. That's but, right. but he's really, I'll, I hate you, it's a, it's a hungry first uh, strategy. But yeah. most, most, a lot of the other European countries are beginning to wake up to that. At least the people are. I, th I think you're right about that. And that's actually one of Orban's 12 points that I do put in my book because I think they're very practical strategy on how to keep your country sovereign, conservative, focused on traditional values, family values. Um, one of those points is to put your country first. Yeah, just like America first policy, hungry first policy. It makes sense. So he's written this out, and for everybody interested, and everybody should be interested, you can see all the elements of what he sees uh, as a way to preserve self-determinization and, yeah. and, and your values uh, right here. And there's it's in the last chapter, and there are things we all can do, like support conservative organizations, which you're doing today by helping me you know, spread the word about the work at CounterPoint Institute to start organizations like that, like I'm doing, to take the media back, like what you're doing. So there's things in there everybody can do, and I, I just think we need to do it on a, a larger scale as people that want to preserve our culture and our country. What kind of response have you gotten to the book? You've talked with a lot of people. Yeah, excellent response, actually. Yeah. Um, y you know, it was kind of cool. Um, I spoke with the House Speaker, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, a few weeks ago about the book, and he called it a guidebook on how to do an effective, uh, popular-based, conservative. Oh, uh, I so agree. Thank you. <laughs> I so agree. It's a guidebook. Thank you. It's it is a guidebook. a guidebook. This is a very useful manual. Thank you. I don't. I don't want to just talk about the problems. I try to lay that out so people understand it. But I want to say, here's also, here's a path forward. Here's hope. Here's a blueprint. 
uh, we have to continue to fight for our country, and I think Hungary has done it extremely effectively. So what, uh, what we've covered so much, I, I, I want to give you kind of a way to give us a, what, what else that your institute is doing and how should we, how, how, how does America take this from here? What's our lesson? First of all, we have to remember that freedom is valuable. And I know a lot of people say that, but it's right now very, very uh, precarious position, I believe, that we're in. One thing that Hungarians said to me is that we remember what it's like not to be free. They were fr only free from the Soviet Union in 1991, during most of our lifetimes here. Um, Americans don't see the insidious encroachment that Marxism has grown in our country over the past 100 years. That was actually the goal of the Communist International to spread communism. And I believe we helped them with giving Stalin these satellite countries where if we had made sure that they w were still Western countries aligned with Western values, we would not have helped perpetuate the, the spread of uh, Marxism and communism. So I want Americans to understand that this could be our last warning. I've never, I don't think in recent history, and, and Bill, you can tell me what you think, that we've ever been in such a position where our government is trying to take freedom away from the, us. There, there are 11 points in my book of communist psychological warfare, Bill, that were written by our Department of Defense in 1959. Every one of those points apply to us today. One of those is using a crisis to gain control. What did we just see with COVID? All over the world, governments, yeah. especially ours, was trying to do that. Well, and now they're going to declare that climate is a health crisis as another way to, to uh, bring about the same measures they, they brought about with COVID. Yeah, you have to watch them. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, but I, I so agree now. I, you know, I read this, I come to this, my career has been mainly in Wall Street and finance and private equity. And so I was not really, I was tunneled into that uh, and didn't really pay much attention to these trends. And a lot of this thing, these things like communism in America, isn't that just sort of McCarthy era stuff? And that didn't happen. And that was just dramatized by yeah. him. And he was a ridiculous man. Well, you read this book and you begin to realize, no, no, no. If you, if you think of it as cultural Marxism, taking over institutions, changing values, yeah. getting rid of the church, getting rid of civil society, that's been going going at, uh, since even before the 50s. It started actually in it the did. 30s in the United States. Yeah. And you had a lot of those people working in the in uh, FDR's administration. Yes. So these exactly things which right. seem to, you know, my friend uh, Todd Zwicky, I've said, used this before. He's a brilliant professor of law. Oh, okay. I think it's George Mason. And oh, the difference yeah. between a conspiracy theory and reality? Uh -huh. Three months. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. Um, Bill, you know, I did not know these things either. I thought they were conspiracy theory as well until yeah. I went to no, Hungary, no, 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 heard just, the stories, yeah. that looked at history, did the research, and absolutely, we we have been infiltrated with with values that were our country was not founded on okay this is the last warning read the book <laughs> uh shay shay bradley farrell a phd and uh know. it's so great to talk with you have you back again we're we're gonna I'm dig we're digging more into this topic on this show so i hope you'll come back with some I other people that. and we can we can dr drive home these points well, and uh, if your listeners would like to go to counterpointinstitute.org, we send out a newsletter like twice a month that <clears throat> will update them on what's going on or go to the go to Amazon and get the book and read it yourself. And you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Shea underscore DC. And I love Instagram. Dr. Shea. All right. <laughs> All right. I've been here with Dr. Shea. Uh, it's Bill Walton, Bill Walton Show. As you know, you can find us on all the major uh, podcast platforms, websites, uh, our website is, as well, and uh, uh, oh gosh, Substack.com, and, and just about every place you can find a digital show, that's where we are. If you liked it, please subscribe. 
If you're already subscribed, urge your friends to do it. Uh, sign up to our show and also send us your comments if you like this, other things you'd like us to see doing. And, uh, you know, welcome to the cause. Okay, thanks for being here. You bet. And thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.